factors coalescing, the price is going up, up, up. And as we said, we could be facing five bucks a gallon by 2012. And joining us now to talk about this grim prediction from Washington, former president of Shell Oil Company and author of Why We Hate Oil Companies, Straight Talk from an Energy Insider, John Hathmeister. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, that sounds like a rhetorical question on the cover of your book. I guess virtually everybody does hate the oil companies. You've been the president of Shell and you've written about it. Thank you for being so honest in this really fascinating book about what's going on out there. If I could, explain to us why you think the price of oil is trending up. What factors are coalescing to bring us there? Well, I, I think, as you were saying in your introduction, we have done nothing in the 111th Congress to improve the supply side of hydrocarbons that we need every day in the economy. We use 20 million barrels of oil every day, Elliot. That's 10,000 gallons a second. In 2008, when we had the last oil price spike, $147 for crude, we had all this drill baby drill rhetoric going around the country. We did nothing. We have had an anti-hydrocarbon administration that has proven by their actions that they would rather work on wind and solar and biofuels. That's where the federal money is going. And just let the oil industry, the coal industry, let them drift now, or hold them back, which is what they're doing now. Now, John, I, I want to take the conversation first to the overseas impact, something you have written about. And let's look. We have a graphic. Let's put it up on the screen here about U.S. consumption versus worldwide consumption. And I think it is important that the public understand that foreign consumption has been going way up while U.S. consumption has not been, and so the foreign markets in China in particular are driving this pricing. Can you explain what that is doing in the marketplace? We have never produced in the world more than 85 million barrels a day. The global system just has not been able to produce more than that. Meanwhile, China, you're absolutely right, there are more than 30 million new cars on the road in China in just the last two years. Over the next two years, there will be another 30 million cars on the roads of China. And it's India. It's Malaysia. It's the whole Asian growth syndrome, which is spike, spiking oil demand unprecedented. By 2012, we're going to need about 90 million barrels a day to meet daily global demand. We're stuck at 85. And in the U.S., we're actually going to be in decline because of the moratorium in the Gulf of Mexico. So global demand drives the crude oil price. Crude oil price drives the gasoline price in the United States. Um, John, you're recommending that we go back to 1970 levels of, of producing 10 million gallons a day or a year. 10 million barrels a day. Excuse me, a day, exactly. And That's right. So why, if we were doing that in 1970, and given that uh, you know the consumption is up and all this other competition, why aren't we doing that now? We have grown to detest drilling in this country. When we were doing 10 million barrels a day, we were drilling off the coast of California. Since the Santa Barbara spill in 1969, we've stopped new drilling off California. We can't drill in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. The president said in, this, in March of this, of this past year that we should be drilling off the east coast and off the eastern Gulf. He's rescinded that. The Secretary of the Interior announced on December 1st that he would postpone the next five-year plan for drilling leases from 2012 to 2017. That basically says this administration is punting on new drilling off posts between now and the rest of the time they're in office if they get a second term. And $5 gasoline, I think, is going to go in the face of them getting a second term because they haven't done anything about it in the meantime. What do you think it's going to take getting uh, gasoline prices up to $5 a gallon for something to happen? And, and what's, what could happen when the prices reach that high? Uh, Americans are not going to be very eager to embrace that price. Uh, I think they will be frustrated and they will be angry. The fact that it's an election year, the American people could say, you know, the people in office haven't done their job. They haven't delivered affordable energy. I said to candidate Obama in 2007 to him directly, if you don't provide more hydrocarbons in the period of 2009 to 2012, you will not like the gas price, which you will be running against when you go up for re-election in 2012. John, you have been a big proponent of increasing hydrocarbon capacity, but you also believe that we're supportive of the cap and trade, in other words, imposing some sort of taxation on carbon production. Why is that? And you're the rare executive who embraced that, rare, rare oil executive who embraced that. Explain that, and where do we go now in that department? I think if you're going to be producing hydrocarbons, you need to be responsible for the total cost. 
which is not just the economic cost but the social cost as well. I believe that there is technology available to dramatically capture the carbon emissions that come from coal, gas, and oil. Let's use that technology to create wealth. A cap and trade system can create wealth for this nation. It's not just cap and tax. The cap and tax people are looking at Waxman Markey, which was basically a cap and tax bill because they miss they did not follow the pattern that the United States Climate Action Partnership put together. Well, They've now ruined the reputation of cap and trade. And I want to I want to in interrupt you because I agree with you on, on, on a sort of a subtle point that people have got to understand. You said something hugely important. Capture the total cost to society of what you're producing. Economists call this an externality. You're saying put on that tax, but then you want to use it, I gather from what you're saying, to create clean coal with the sequestration of the carbon and where you submerge it below earth or you do it with uh, natural gas. You want to use that tax to create alternative clean energies, even if they're carbon based. Is that, is that how I understand you? Absolutely. We need a 21st century energy system to replace the old aging 20th century energy system. Let's use technology to its fullest advantage to be able to continue to produce coal in, in responsible ways to burn that coal through pulverization and gasification. The gasification of the coal with carbon capture and sequestration puts a whole no other, another hundred year life on the availability of clean coal, affordable electricity for the nation. The same thing could be done in reducing emissions in refineries which if everybody had to do it, it could be done. Look, I, I totally agree, which is why I think an across-the-board tax that did capture that cost would be provide the funding source for the technology and the R&D you're talking about. Now, to put this in numbers, though, it is extraordinarily expensive, and the, the Department of Energy had been funding some of these sequestration programs. They basically pulled back because people got scared by the money, by the dollars, about billions of dollars for each one of these coal plants. Do you think that's the direction we should be going nonetheless? The answer, Elliot, is to raise production. If the companies could increase production, they're getting the revenue to pay the extra costs, aren't they? By raising to, from 7 million barrels a day to 10 million barrels a day, Lord knows we need it. We use 20 million barrels a day. That's added revenue to companies. That's higher profitability to companies. Now use some of that added profitability to put the technological improvements into refineries, into coal mining, into coal burning in coal plants, and it pays for itself because we're using more of it. How about nukes? You have not mentioned nukes uh, recently. Do you see them as being a critical part, at least bridging the gap until other technologies emerge? I think we should be expanding the nuclear fleet in a couple of ways. We should make a long-term commitment to a much higher number of nuclear plants so that we could commoditize the construction, the manufacturing, and the development of nuclear energy going forward so it's less costly. Commoditizing means make it the same, the way the French do. We should also explore the advances of thorium. Thorium is a form of, of fission that is safer, according to the experts, than nuclear, and it is so, there's so much more of it. We're never going to run out of energy in this world. What we never have had, however, in this country is an energy plan for the future that takes the next zero to ten years and does what we need to do the next tw ten to twenty-five years, the next twenty-five years, the fifty-year plan. That's what you need. Guess what China's doing? They're doing a 50-year plan. Guess what the EU is doing? They're doing a 50-year plan. What are we doing? We're waiting for the next election and watching the gas price in between. It's an absurd way to run the world's largest economy, but we've so politicized energy and the facets of energy, we can't get away from the politics of it. Well, John, speaking of China, you know, China's taken out the middleman and is buying directly from countries in Africa like Sudan and Nigeria. What effect does that have on us? It shrinks the global pool of oil available, which is going to lead to price spiking in the crude oil price. Because they're getting a contracted price in China, we in the U.S. are left with what's in the available global pool, which will be a much higher price. So they're taking care of themselves, and we're going to be exposed to rapidly changing and volatile oil crude oil prices. Well, you have a big message out there and, and some ideas that people need to hear. And I understand you've, you've met with governors and mayors, and you've, you say you've talked to the president in 2007. Is anyone listening? In the current administration, it has been very difficult to get through the door. I got through the door once in the entire two-year period thus far, and the meeting was cut short. There is not a keen interest in doing anything for hydrocarbons other than making them more expensive so that other forms of energy look relatively less expensive. That's not a way to go. We need a both and answer. 
We need both more hydrocarbons in the short term because we still have 250 million cars on the road that only use gas. The new Leaf, the new Nissan Leaf, the new uh, Chevy Volt, there are only hundreds then thousands on the roads, not millions. To make a, a real dent in the gasoline demand is going to take another decade or longer. And so in the meantime, where's our hydrocarbons coming from? We're not drilling for them. We're going to import them. It's going to be more expensive. It's foolish to do it this way. John, I agree with much of what you're saying, but there is one word that I, I really do think we need to add to this conversation. That is the word efficiency. They, over the time timeline, timeline you're talking about, granted, it will take a decade till efficiency really has an impact in the automotive sector because it takes that long till enough of the fleet is captured by the new regs. Should we not be increasing the miles per gallon we get from cars? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I go even further, Elliot. I say get rid of the internal combustion engine altogether. That is Put dramatic. together a 25-year roadmap to get rid of the internal combustion engine, replace it fully with batteries and with hydrogen fuel cells and appropriate mass transit systems in dense population areas. We can dramatically reduce the demand for oil in that in that way. Look, it, it seems to me, and this is what so captivates me about your book and what you're proposing, there is a coalition that should be formed around what you're proposing. Because you're not just saying drill and forget the environment, we don't care. care. You're saying drill, but put on a carbon tax, use that to fund sequestration. Yes, nukes. Yes, efficiency. Yes, transform our entire economy. It, it sounds like such a centrist, sensible system. And their governor, we were chatting with Ed Rendell yesterday, governor of Pennsylvania. He's for all this. Why can you not form some sort of political coalition, coalition around this concept? In the two-year, four-year cycle of politics, in the winner-loser game of politics, there is no ability in that short time frame to pull people together because they're off running for office, number one. Number two, we've made such a complex government for ourselves. Thirteen executive branch agencies govern energy. Twenty-six congressional committees govern energy. They don't want to give it up. They want to keep governing energy. My suggestion is change the governance. Put into place the equivalent of a Fed for the future of energy to deal with supply, demand, environment, and infrastructure. Put a, an independent body in place that doesn't worry about the next election or who's in the majority party in the, in the Congress, the House, or the Senate, or the White House. Because that is hurting the consumers, the voters of America, by causing them to have less efficiency, less technology, higher cost energy, all of which is going to make our economy that much more vulnerable and that much weaker to global competition. Finally, before we let you go, John, uh, not to filibuster, but what kind of car do you drive? I have, uh, we got rid of our foreign made cars and I have a, a, a Ford and a, and a GM car. Well, that's very American of you. Well, wait, wait, what's wrong with Chrysler? Come on, Chrysler's going to call you tomorrow morning and say they'll offer you a deal. We'll, we'll see if our children need a Chrysler. All right, John Hoffmeister, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Coming up, Iraq's prime minister says American troops are not welcomed beyond 2011. But what will that mean for the war?